uh, yeah, so thanks everybody for uh, logging in and thanks to the organizers for uh, having me. So um, as the kind of unwieldy title of this paper suggests, I'm gonna talk about sort of two things. So, um, or really have two goals here. So uh, one is to uh, familiarize people who maybe don't know this literature uh, very well so far with um, sort of ongoing debate in uh, the philosophy of conspiracy theories about uh, particularism. So some of this will just be sort of background uh, in that area. Um, but the other thing I wanna do um, maybe for people who are already a bit more familiar with this literature is to um, actually offer a sort of argument against uh, particularism or at least one version of particularism. Um, and so ultimately I'm gonna argue that we have a sort of reason for suspicion of conspiracy theories as a class rather than, uh, uh, you know, based on the evidence for each particular theory. Uh, so let's dive in. So um, the basic distinction here um, between uh, views on the epistemology of conspiracy theories is between uh, generalism and particularism. Um, and so this is a distinction that was introduced in the paper by uh, Joel, uh, Joel Bunting and uh, Jason Taylor. So uh, generalism is the view as they define it that uh, the rationality of conspiracy theories can be assessed without considering particular conspiracy theories. Uh, particularism on the other hand uh, denies that the rationality of conspiracy theories can be assessed without considering particular conspiracy theories. Um, so as we go on, I'll say a bit more about what, uh, what exactly these theses seem to mean. Um, but I think just as a sort of way of orienting ourselves, uh, it's helpful to think about the generalism, particularism distinction as being sort of the closest thing this literature has to a sort of big internalism versus externalism debate uh, or something along those lines. Um, so this uh, comparison I think is helpful in a way uh, with some interpretive issues because um, as in the case of internalism versus externalism, it's not as if there are really just two competing theses. Um, rather, there's sort of a constellation of internalist theses and a constellation of externalist theses. Oftentimes, uh, the externalist theses are defined sort of each one in relation to an internalist thesis. Um, and I think, uh, or I'm going to suggest anyway, that something sort of similar is going on in the case of generalism and particularism. Really, there's not just one sort of thesis on each side, but there's this sort of little constellation of, of uh, theses. Um, so there is this, I think, uh, maybe useful analogy to internalism, externalism here. Um, one distinction though is that, uh, you know, a sort of curious feature of this literature is that um, practically no one actually explicitly defends generalism. So uh, for the most part, when people are described as generalists, it's because of the sort of language that they tend to use. So oftentimes, for instance, uh, people writing in uh, social science literature, for instance, are described as generalists, even though they don't really make, you know, explicitly defend uh, generalism. Um, I mean, there's maybe one uh, instance where someone really explicitly defends generalism. That's um, Patrick Stokes. I think he defends what he calls a defeasible generalism, something along those lines. Um, but for the most part, it's not like internalism, externalism, where, where there are sort of explicit defenders of each view. Um, so that's one sort of big uh, distinction here. Well, maybe I think it'll become a bit clearer as we go on, maybe why people don't tend to explicitly defend generalism. Um, the other distinction, and this is something that uh, if you're not familiar with this literature might be a little bit surprising, but the uh, rhetoric in this literature is quite, um, uh, quite heated in some cases, as we'll see. Um, and so as we go along, I think we'll sort of pick up the reasons for that as well. Um, so basically, uh, in this talk, I'm going to argue that there are some problems with particularism. Um, so first, uh, maybe most straightforwardly, uh, I think it's unclear as a thesis along a range of different uh, dimensions. So for instance, it's not always clear whether particulars are uh, creating a thesis about 
conspiracy theories or beliefs concerning uh, conspiracy theories. Um, I think there are weak and strong versions of particularism. Uh, some versions of particularism are so weak that uh, they're practically commonsensical, um, whereas others, I think, are uh, quite dubious and uh, in particular offer a sort of argument directly against strong particularism. Um, then there are also these sort of tangential issues about, uh, you know, uh, you know, what particulars are really saying. So is it a claim about what we should be believing or what we should be doing in terms of uh, investigating conspiracy theories or not? Um, so the second uh, big issue, though, with particularism is, as I'll argue, I think the historical record, uh, essentially the track record of conspiracy theories, provides us with a reason to be skeptical of conspiracy theories uh, as a class. Um, Okay, but before we get into that, uh, a little bit of background stuff. So as people who are uh, at all familiar with this literature will know, one of the big things that's going on in philosophy of conspiracy theories is just attempting to define what these actually are. This is one of the major sort of projects in this area. Um, so roughly, I think there are three different kinds of definitions that people tend to give of what conspiracy theories are. One is a sort of just broad, uh, literal definition of conspiracy theories. So according to this approach, conspiracy theories are just theories that allege conspiracies. So whenever you have a theory and it alleges that people are sort of acting in secret, uh, usually to bring about some end that uh, most people would deem nefarious, uh, that would be a conspiracy theory according to the broad definition. Um, some people tend to favor uh, sort of pejorative definitions. So uh, again, this often comes out in the sort of social science literature. You'll see people using these pejorative definitions. Uh, on these definitions, conspiracy theories are defined in part by some deficiency, usually some epistemic deficiency. Uh, maybe that they're false, that they lack evidence, uh, they're unjustified, something along these lines. Uh, in the final, um, class of uh, definitions are what you might call counter official definitions. So um, on this view, conspiracy theories are theories that uh, allege conspiracies that are implicitly or explicitly rejected by authorities. So it might be that the authorities sort of have uh, or claim sort of quite explicitly that the conspiracy theory is false or that the theory is false. Uh, or it might just be that based on the other things that the authorities say, uh, you know, we have strong reason to doubt the, uh, the theory in question. Maybe it's ontology is uh, dubious in light of what the authorities tell us. Um, so counter official definitions can take one of two types, depending on how we think about uh, the official account or how we think about authority. So if we think we might think on one hand of authorities as being sort of epistemic authorities. So these would be, you know, when we describe someone as an authority on a subject, we're invoking epistemic uh, authority, uh, or it might be governmental authority. So, uh, you know, some government agency or something like that, um, uh, and that would be a sort of governmental uh, authority. Um, <clears throat> so my preference is basically for a counter uh, official definition. Um, so, uh, the reason for this, and um, other people offer somewhat similar reasoning, uh, Kassam, for instance, offers somewhat similar reasoning, is that in ordinary usage, uh, we simply don't use conspiracy theory, that term, uh, in the way that uh, you would expect if the broad or literal definition were true. Um, so, for instance, uh, the theory that uh, people working on behalf of uh, Al-Qaeda uh, attack the World Trade Center. That's, that's a, alleging a conspiracy, but it's not a uh, conspiracy theory. Um, uh, another reason for a counterofficial definition is that this really seems to be what, uh, you know, academics are actually interested in. So in some cases, actually, uh, in psychological literature, for instance, there are some cases where um, at the beginning of the paper, they'll sort of define their terms and they'll, you know, give something like the broad definition of conspiracy theory, but 
Then when it comes time to the actual uh, experimental work, generally speaking, the sorts of theories that they're testing or people's beliefs in these theories are things that are counter official rather than just being general allegations of uh, conspiracy. Um, and so my concern would be that uh, if we move away from a sort of counter official definition and I you know, defend here uh, conspiracy theories understood broadly, uh, that'll effectively just be changing the subject, I think, away from what um, members of the public and academics are really interested in. Um, and the final uh, thing to say in favor of a counter, defini uh, counter official definition is that I think that, you know, in this area, uh, you're never going to have a theory that aligns perfect, or, or you're never going to have a definition that aligns perfectly with usage. But at the very least, um, counter official conspiracy theories are an important subclass of conspiracy theories. So insofar as I argue that, uh, you know, we have reason to be dubious of these as a class, um, that's something, right? Um, I, I'm, you know, some people might say that I haven't really offered an argument uh, to be skeptical of conspiracy theories in general as a class understood broadly, but that's sort of okay for my purposes uh, because I think most people are interested in the counter official ones uh, anyway. Um, okay, uh, last thing that I'll, um, uh, uh, actually two, two other things I'll mention about this. So even uh, particularists who in general tend to favor the broad definition of conspiracy theories um, often end up talking about counter official theories, right? So JFK assassination theories and uh, September 11th uh, theories, things like this. Um, that's often true. That's not universally true, but it's often true. Um, uh, now, the, yeah, the last thing that I'll mention about this is, of course, because I'm using a counter official definition and particularists oftentimes favor a broad or literal definition. Uh, some particulars will basically shrug off my ultimate criticism of particulars. I'm thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the wrong thing, essentially. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, again, given what members of the public and academics are really interested in, it's okay to focus on this narrower class. Uh, okay, so how am I going to understand conspiracy theories? Uh, I'm going to understand them as follows. So conspiracy theories are theories alleging conspiracies uh, that are implicitly or explicitly rejected by relevant epistemic uh, authorities. So uh, what the relevant epistemic authorities are will depend on the conspiracy theory in question. Could be scientists, could be doctors, could be, uh, uh, could be journalists, um, could in some cases be intelligence analysts, something like this, right? Um, one thing I'll, I'll note about this definition um, is that uh, this is actually quite different from the definition that I have used in the past and that some other people have, have used uh, insofar as on this definition, conspiracy theories aren't necessarily explanations of historical uh, events. Um, so the reason that I've moved away from thinking about conspiracy theories as explanations of historical events is just simply that um, uh, it seems that some conspiracy theories are positing sort of ongoing plans to do something in the future, as opposed to uh, plans that have been carried out in the past, right? Um, so epistemic uh, authority, as I'm understanding it here, is really a matter of credentials, so degrees, awards, things like this professional roles uh, and the like. Uh, so the important thing about this is that um, epistemic authority so understood doesn't imply reliability. So epistemic authorities aren't defined as being people who are uh, quite reliable in their judgments or their claims or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> rather epistemic authorities are defined in terms of basically stations that they hold and things like this. Um, this is important for various reasons. Um, one is that this means that um, present definition of, uh, of conspiracy theories is not pejorative, right? Uh, you might say it would be pejorative if epistemic authorities were defined in terms of their reliability. And then people could always be sort of dubious about how reliable such and such people are. And then there would be a debate about what's actually conspiracy theory in light of that. Um, but on the present definition, 
conspiracy theories are basically identifiable as such, uh, so long as we know who the people are who have the relevant credentials and things like this, uh, we can identify what the conspiracy theories are. Uh, okay, so um, now turning to some of the uh, concerns about particularism. So uh, the first is, I think, uh, on the face of it anyway, some something of a trivial sort of uh, objection here. But um, uh, this is just about how particularism is really to be understood. So Bunting and Taylor uh, explicitly define particularism as concerning theories. You can see that in the original definition that they set out. Uh, but that focus on theories is not really consistent among Bunting and Taylor and subsequent commentators. So uh, later in the paper, uh, Bunting and Taylor say, uh, central to these discussions is the question of whether it's ever rational to accept or believe a conspiracy. Similarly, Dentith, who's done a lot of work developing uh, particularism, says that the current findings in the philosophy of conspiracy theories to coin a new discipline simply show that belief in conspiracy theories is not prima facie uh, irrational. So in other words, uh, the, the initial sort of, you know, this is a barely a concern, but uh, something worth noting is that particularism is sometimes thought about in terms of theories, sometimes thought about in terms of uh, beliefs. So um, I think actually that uh, recognizing this ambiguity in what particularism is helps to make sense of some aspects of the literature. Um, uh, so basically, I think that there really are two distinct kinds of particularist projects. And uh, we might define in contrast to those two particular kinds of, or, or two distinct kinds of uh, roughly generalist projects. Um, so one of these is the defense of the rationality of beliefs in conspiracy theories. Uh, the other project is for particularists is a defense of conspiracy theories uh, themselves. So, right. Uh, the thing to notice here is that these two projects really uh, require attention to two totally different types of things. So when we think about assessing beliefs in conspiracy theories, relevant considerations would be things like the psychology of conspiracy theory believers, epistemic virtues and vices of individual believers, uh, the epistemic environments people are in, uh, and things like this, right? It could turn out that people are rational to believe pretty silly things given that they're in the right environment. Um, but assessing conspiracy theories themselves requires attention to other things. So uh, sometimes people will point to just potentially problematic features of conspiracy theories. Uh, so things like maybe they're unfalsifiable, uh, maybe as I'll argue, the big problem with them is that they're contrary to the claims of epistemic authorities. Uh, you might point to the available evidence, you might point to history, uh, and so on. Uh, but we'll be attending to quite different things. Um, so recognizing these two distinct projects, I think, uh, can make sense of what otherwise seem like sort of non sequiturs in the literature. So if you think that you're, cons you know, criticizing um, conspiracy theories themselves, by way of looking at the kind of psychological quirks of conspiracy theory believers, obviously that's not going to be a convincing line of argument. Uh, but if you're assessing, uh, you know, the psychological uh, traits of conspiracy uh, theorizers or, or uh, people who believe conspiracy theories, um, that's going to be relevant when you're thinking about the probability that any particular belief in a conspiracy theory is rational, right? If you know, for instance, that uh, the reason a lot of people believe conspiracy theories is that they sort of have a tendency to over-recognize patterns or illusory patterns or something like that, then that might be a reason to believe that any particular belief in a conspiracy theory is probably not really rational. It's based on some uh, psychological quirk or something like that. Uh, that, of course, tells you nothing at all about the quality of the theory itself, uh, but it is relevant, I think, for this other uh, this other question about assessing conspiracy beliefs uh, themselves. Uh, okay, so um, 
again, that, that's sort of the first little concern about particularism is that there's a bit of ambiguity about beliefs or theories. Uh, turning to another concern that uh, is maybe more serious. Um, so it seems to me that uh, particularists have in mind a range of different strengths of theses. So something we might call weak particularism says that um, the evidence specific to particular conspiracy theories is a relevant consideration in assessing those theories, right? Um, so this, uh, I think, maybe some of the reason why people don't um, explicitly defend generalism is if you think that the opposition is something like weak particularism, which at least on its face seems overwhelmingly plausible, uh, you're going to be loath to sort of uh, defend anything that conflicts with that. Um, one thing to note, though, about weak particularism is that it's consistent uh, with the existence of evidence uh, that cast out on conspiracy theories as a class. Um, right? Um, might be that there's sort of general evidence against conspiracy theories, but nonetheless, we should still pay some attention to the evidence bearing on particular theories. Um, but I think we can distinguish between uh, weak particularism and what I call strong particularism. Uh, according to this view, there's no grounds for a general suspicion of conspiracy theories as a class. So particularists, uh, it seems to me, sometimes uh, make uh, claims along these lines. So uh, Dentith, for instance, says uh, philosophers interested in the topic of belief in conspiracy theories, with few exceptions, have argued that you can't principally assess conspiracy theories as a class, but rather we must undertake such an analysis on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the prima facie suspicion of conspiracy theories generally, before assessing the particulars of individual theories, gets things back to front. So. Um, my, my thought is that uh, weak particularism is going to be quite defensible, um, but strong particularism, where's the, where there's this thought that there's no general basis for uh, skepticism uh, about conspiracy theories, uh, that view, I think, is uh, much more dubious. So principally, uh, when we get towards the end, I'll be arguing really against strong particularism. Uh, what I have to say will raise some issues, I think, for weak particularism, but is not really intended as a, uh, any sort of a decisive argument against it or anything like that. Um, so turning to a final uh, uh, particularist thesis that's a bit different, uh, particulars sometimes put their view uh, in terms of whether and how we should investigate uh, conspiracy theories. So uh, Charles Pigden, for instance, says, I advocate the alternative strategy of not dismissing conspiracy theories out of hand simply because they're conspiracy theories, but of being prepared to investigate them and even to believe them if that's what the evidence uh, indicates. <clears throat> so um, this is, I think, another interesting feature of the literature to, um, to recognize. Uh, seems to be the case that uh, particularists are in part motivated by the thought that uh, a generalist attitude of some sort, you know, one of those constellation of theses uh, is harmful in a way. So as David Cody says, those who are excessively unwilling to believe in conspiracy harm us all by making it easier for conspirators to remain undetected. And as, uh, as Pigden says, uh, the idea that conspiracy theories as such are somehow intellectually suspect uh, is a superstitious or irrational belief, since there's no reason whatsoever to think it's true. Uh, it's an idiotic superstition, since a modicum of critical reflection reveals that it's false. And it's a dangerous superstition, since it invests the lies of Asians and self-deceptions of torturers and warmongers uh, with a spurious air of methodological sophistication. So if somebody poo-poos a conspiracy theory uh, of yours simply because it's a conspiracy theory, then you know that they're either a naive or a fool or quite likely an unlovely combination of the uh, two. Um, so I mentioned before, right, that the, uh, the rhetoric in this literature is more heated than you would get in the internalist externalist literature, for instance. Um, the reason I think being that people who are writing in this literature really have actual practical goals, you know, this is more connected maybe to ordinary life than some other areas of uh, philosophy are, and so um, stakes 
you know, perceived as being higher or something like this. Um, but I, I think that these concerns are um, a little bit overblown, or at least they're not a reason to accept a certain kind of uh, particularism. So Cody and Pigeon, uh, uh, Pigden uh, connect the issue of suspicion of conspiracy theories to the unwillingness to investigate such theories. Uh, but whether to investigate conspiracy theories is just a pragmatic decision. Um, and the willingness to investigate a potential conspiracy doesn't depend on having a prior belief that it's probable or even that it's sort of not improbable uh, that it's occurred, right? Uh, you might even have a good practical reason to investigate a conspiracy theory, uh, even if you really strongly believe that the conspiracy uh, theory is false. So, right, you could think of investigation as just being a sort of deterrent to future uh, uh, conspiring rather than being a way of revealing what is, you know, plausibly an existing conspiracy. Um, so this line of argument about the potential harms of, uh, you know, a, a general sort of attitude, I think, uh, is not a good reason to accept at least a certain kind of particularism where that's particularism about uh, our assessment of conspiracy theories. Um, okay, so now turning to the um, sort of argument against at least strong particularism. Um, so what I'm gonna do is effectively try to flip uh, an argument that's sometimes invoked by particularists themselves, one that appeals to the historical uh, record. Um, so the basic idea is that some defenders of particularism have argued that historical instances of conspiracy uh, motivate the ascription of a relatively high probability to uh, conspiracy theories. So uh, Higgins says, for instance, Western governments and government agencies have engaged in morally dodgy Conspiracies, hence theories which say that they do are not obviously faulty or foolish. Uh, Basham, uh, Lee Basham says, 9-11 alternatives begin by trying to raise our judgment of the prior probability uh, of a U.S. government conspiracy. And Dentith says, our estimates as to how independently likely conspiracies are varies over time. Certainly post the revelations of the NSA's mass surveillance program by Edward Snowden in 2013, Claims of a large scale political conspiracy have been treated much more sympathetically and considered more likely by ordinary reasoners. Uh, it appears people underestimated how independently likely it was that a major political conspiracy was happening here and now. Uh, working at the true prior probability or independent likeliness of claims of conspiracy being in amongst the pool of credible explanatory hypotheses uh, will be, of course, difficult. However, it's fair to say that people either underestimate or underplay both historical and contemporary accounts of events, which cite conspiracies as salient causes. So on the face of things, this actually seems like a, a pretty reasonable argument that uh, look, we have plenty of examples of real historical conspiracies. And so uh, looks like we don't have this reason to be dubious of, uh, of you know, contemporary conspiracy theories. Um, so one thing that I think is interesting about this, uh, this line of argument is that this is not just a feature of the sort of particularist versus generalist literature, uh, but this is a common line of argument for people who are not in academia at all. Um, so I won't uh, read through all of this, but uh, just to give you a sense of this, right, a uh, couple of prominent conspiracy theorists here. Uh, I don't know how um, well-known Jesse Ventura is outside of the US, but uh, he was a governor, he was an actor, he was a wrestler, and he's a prolific uh, conspiracy theorist. And he makes similar sorts of arguments, right? That um, <clears throat> we know about things like Operation Northwoods. Uh, so Ventura says, well, what Operation Northwoods was a sort of possible plan for, I think 9-11 was. He's a, sort of 9-11 truth there. Uh, Alex Jones, probably better known, um, makes the same sort of arguments. Uh, um, it's hard to find actually a transcript of Alex Jones being at all coherent, but this is from a deposition that he gave where he's still talking about this stuff. Uh, but same sort of um, line of reasoning here. Historical instances of conspiracy uh, give us reason to be not sort of dubious of, uh, of new conspiracy theories. 
Um, so some problems with this argument. So uh, first of all, that some conspiracy has occurred doesn't imply that some conspiracy theory is true, uh, at least not given the way that I'm uh, defining uh, conspiracy theory anyway. So here's a place where, of course, particulars who favor a broad or literal definition will just reject this as being a problem, right? Um, they'll say, look, there have been all these conspiracies in the past. That's a reason to believe that there's conspiracies now. Conspiracies theories are just theories that allege conspiracies. And so uh, this is a good argument. But if you accept something more like the restricted definition that I've argued for, uh, this is a real problem, I think. Um, Second problem, uh, that a lot of conspiracy theories have been true. So even if we find a lot of cases of historically true conspiracy theories, and there are some, right? Um, that doesn't tell us very much at all about um, the probability that other conspiracy theories are true. Um, at a minimum, what you need to know is the proportion of conspiracy theories are true, right? If there are some true conspiracy theories, but only because there are you know, tons and tons of conspiracy theories, occasionally they're correct, that doesn't really give you any reason to, um, uh, to avoid skepticism about uh, current conspiracy theories. Um, and finally, maybe the biggest problem is that I think the historical record uh, gives us grounds for a strong presumption uh, against uh, conspiracy theories as a class. Um, so the basic style of argument that I'm going for here is along the lines of the pessimistic meta-induction in, uh, in science. So uh, there's really at least two versions of this argument, the pessimistic meta-induction. The first uh, most uh, straightforward um, version of this is something that's offered by Putnam. He doesn't really endorse it, of course, but he uh, kind of floats it anyway. And the basic idea here is that when we consider the high proportion of false half scientific theories, uh, that gives us reason to think that uh, contemporary scientific theories are probably false. Uh, a second, somewhat more sophisticated version of the argument um, uh, comes from Wadden. Uh, the basic idea being that from the high proportion of past successful scientific theories that turned out to be false, um, we can conclude that success is not really a reliable indicator of truth uh, for scientific theories. Um, so there's some problems with both of these arguments uh, in the case of science. So if science is continuously uh, improving, as the realists would suggest, um, then the falsity of past theories doesn't really give us any reason to doubt current theories. Um, and Wadden's version uh, as uh, Peter J. Lewis argues, um, doesn't rule out the possibility that there have been many um, successful but false theories only due to the existence of a large number of false theories in the past. So if the base rate of false theories is high, then even if success is a reliable test for truth, um, it, you'll still get uh, many false positives. Um, so in the case of science, the success of these um, uh, pessimistic inductions is somewhat uh, dubious. Uh, but I think actually they're pretty good in the case of conspiracy theories. Um, so in the case of conspiracy theories, the test for truth is not, uh, you know, empirical success, um, understood to include things like predictive success. Uh, but it's just something like conformity to available evidence. Um, so, right, you could um, have different versions of this pessimistic meta-induction for uh, conspiracy theories based on Putnam and based on Wadden. I'm going to focus on the Wadden kind because I think it's in a way more interesting. But um, according to this uh, argument, uh, the long history of false conspiracy theories that nonetheless conform to the evidence is a reason to doubt that conformity to evidence is a reliable indicator of the truth of contemporary conspiracy theories. Um, if you're wondering why I'm thinking that there are a lot of these theories that conform to the evidence, I'll uh, explain why in a minute. But um, the important thing about this argument is that it doesn't, I think, succumb to the base rate objection um, that Lawton's argument arguably succumbs to. So, um, if it were merely the case that most evidence conforming conspiracy theories were false, uh, it might nonetheless be the case 
that uh, evidence conformity is a good test for truth, right? Could just be another base rate thing going on. Um, although, right, in the absence of any reason to accept something analogous to convergent realism, that would not help the, uh, the particulars very much. Uh, it would be a very compelling argument, uh, objection in this context. Uh, however, uh, it's not only true that most evidence conforming conspiracy theories are false, uh, but it's also the case that most false conspiracy theories are evidence conforming in a sense that I'll talk about in a second. Right, and so for this reason, uh, the base rate objection uh, isn't going to apply to the Lawton version of the uh, pessimistic meta induction for conspiracy theories. Um, okay. So why am I claiming that most false conspiracy theories nonetheless conform to the evidence? Um, so this has to do with a common theme in the literature about unfalsifiability. So, um, right, the, the idea that conspiracy theories are in a sense unfalsifiable is a common uh, claim in the literature. So Brian Keeley says, for instance, uh, this is one of the most curious features of these theories to my knowledge, conspiracy theories are the only theories for which evidence against them is actually construed as evidence in favor of them. Uh, the more evidence piled up by the authorities in favor of a given theory, the more conspiracy theorists, uh, the more the conspiracy theorist points to how badly they must want us to believe the official story. Or as uh, Lee Basham says, a closed door to future investigation, a plethora of false leads and disinformation produced by the conspirators and those they influence all there to protect the conspiracy and the conspirators. This reflects one of the great epistemic strengths of conspiracy theory, its ability to take evidence that appears to be evidence against the theory and turn it into evidence for the theory. So um, <clears throat> previously, some people have thought that the mere fact that uh, conspiracy theories are unfalsifiable in this way uh, is a problem for conspiracy theories. Um, but, um, Fosters have argued that that's not really the case. So um, Keeley says, for instance, uh, my claim here is that unfalsifiability is only a reasonable criterion in cases where we don't have reason uh, to believe that there are powerful agents seeking to steer our investigation away from the truth of the matter. Um, so, right, the idea is that, you know, if your suspicion is that there are people who are trying to cover something up, then, uh, you know, the fact that you don't interpret apparent counter evidence as really being counter evidence isn't really a problem, right? Uh, it could be that there are some really true theories that are unfalsifiable for that reason. Uh, but I think unfalsifiability is a problem for a more sophisticated reason. So uh, the same malleability by which conspiracy theories are unfalsifiable also accounts for the ability of any conspiracy theory to accommodate nearly any evidence. So uh, the mere conformity to evidence is not a strong indicator of truth for conspiracy theories. Um, moreover, focusing solely on the evidence particular to individual conspiracy theories uh, might be misleading um, uh, because you know, given this feature of conspiracy theories, uh, we're going to find evidence for them, right? Um, okay, so uh, part of the argument here is that there are a lot of these false conspiracy theories that nonetheless conform to the evidence. So it's worth, I think, reflecting on just how many false conspiracy theories uh, there are, right? So one reason to say, just as a general matter, that there are a lot of these theories, uh, or yeah, so actually one, um, one sort of concern you might have is that maybe there aren't so many of these theories, right? So some of the recent work in uh, philosophy and psychology of conspiracy theories might lead you to think that basically conspiracy theories arrive when there's some momentous event, some assassination or some war or some pandemic. Um, and in fact, right, it does seem to be the case that uh, momentous events seem to inspire conspiracy theories at a higher rate than less significant events. So in an experimental context, just by sort of varying the uh, uh, the significance of the event, you can inspire people to construct more conspiracy theories or be more prone to believe in conspiracy theories about it um, and so on. Uh, but it, of course, doesn't follow that most conspiracy theories concern momentous events. And that's because there just are a lot more kind of trivial events than momentous ones. So even if each trivial event 
doesn't inspire a lot of conspiracy theories and momentous events too. The fact that there are a lot more trivial events, uh, you know, there might still be more conspiracy theories about them. So just for instance, some examples, um, there were a lot of uh, Suez Canal conspiracy theories when the, when the canal was blocked. Uh, probably in 20 years, people won't remember those uh, in the way that they'll remember the pandemic conspiracy theories, uh, but there were a lot of these theories floating around. Uh, an even more trivial one, Trump's farewell speech, uh, he had 17 American flags lined up. Um, what's the 17th letter of the alphabet? Well, Q. And so there's a conspiracy theory about the number of flags. This is just to say that the most trivial thing in the world can give rise to conspiracy theories and, and does give rise to conspiracy theories. Um, so, uh, right, another reason to think that there are just a lot of false conspiracy theories is that the same events consistently generate conspiracy theories. Um, so kind of interestingly, um, if you go back about 10 years to the, uh, the swine flu, uh, there weren't just conspiracy theories about that, but there were basically the same conspiracy theories that there are now about uh, about uh, the COVID vaccine. So there were concerns that there would be a H1N1 vaccine that would uh, involve microchips. Um, uh, another reason, right, uh, there are individuals with a lot of conspiracy theories swirling around them. Most obvious example right now is Joe Biden, who some people think is a clone, other people think is a uh, hologram, others that he's a white hat, so he's secretly working for Trump actually. Um, and my favorite one that is currently being played by the actor James Woods. Um, and of course, uh, lastly, uh, right, there are just individuals and groups that just come up consistently with lots of conspiracy theories. So, you know, the ones about Joe Biden I have here are from people in the QAnon community, uh, but then, you know, people like Alex Jones and other people who basically just profit from uh, making these up consistently. So this is just to say that there are a lot of these theories and uh, given their sort of unfalsifiable nature, you can kind of make any of them work if you're willing to make the right background uh, assumptions, right? So um, here's the, the lesson, right? Um, when it comes to conspiracy theories, uh, mere conformity to evidence, I think is not a reliable indicator of truth. Um, so I think a kind of interesting way of looking at this is by thinking about a game uh, invented by the historian Rob uh, McDougall. So uh, he had each player in the game choose some historical figure, uh, and then he told them, we're looking for evidence of a secret conspiracy of vampires that's pulled the strings behind the world for hundreds of years. So we went through what we knew about each of our historical figures and found quote unquote evidence for each one's role for or against the great vampire conspiracy. Uh, if anything, they were too willing to indulge me we were very quickly spun out a goofy little chronicle of the vampire versus electricizer war behind the world. <clears throat> but we probably didn't work at it long enough to get the real kick of auto historic apophenia. When the evidence starts to line up all too well with fantasy you just concocted and you skate right up to the edge of believing. It's a powerful and uncanny feeling. Uh, and if it serves as a good inoculation against pseudo historical thinking, uh, it also colors your relationship with real history ever after. Um, so what I like about this is this idea of this game as being a sort of good inoculation against pseudo historical thinking, sort of uh, conspiratorial thinking. Um, I think the same is true of just thinking about the history of conspiracy theories, where we can see all these theories and you can see how, if you make the right background assumptions, uh, they're going to look plausible to you and they're going to seem to fit the evidence. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, right, McDougall's case is really about this game, but I think the same thing is true of thinking about uh, uh, just past conspiracy theories. Um, so I think we can think of history as a sort of inoculation against uh, thinking uh, that uh, conspiracy theories are, are plausible in light of seeming to conform to the evidence. Uh, Inoculation might not be the best uh, metaphor in this context, but uh, you get the idea. Um, so lastly, just some objections and replies. <clears throat> so first sort of objection would be, well, look, you can't have a pessimistic meta induction on conspiracy theories because the theories have nothing to do with each other, right? There's no basis really for any sort of inductive objection between them. Um, 
So the idea, though, is that the connection between conspiracy theories derives uh, from the nature of such theories as counter to the claims of epistemic authorities. That's the connection. So the idea then is that um, history tells us when we consider all these past false theories uh, that believing claims that conflict with what the relevant epistemic authorities say is a poor strategy, um, right? So the connection is their conflict with what the epistemic authorities say rather than necessarily being their individual content. Um, I mean, in some cases there is overlap in content. So the H1N1 conspiracy theories and the current COVID conspiracy theories, there's a lot of overlap there, but more generally, right? This is uh, the idea. Um, <clears throat> second sort of concern would be that the pessimistic meta-induction proves too much that uh, evidence conformity is generally a poor test of truth, right? Uh, this interestingly is sort of what uh, seems McDougall is alluding to here, right? Where going through this exercise colors your relationship to real history afterwards. You might worry, you know, what does evidence conformity tell us about anything if it doesn't tell us that conspiracy theories are probably true? Um, so uh, the thought though is that when we look at uh, history, what we can see is that there's a certain way of maintaining conformity to evidence, which will involve things like casting doubt on the relevant epistemic authorities. And that is not a good guide to truth. Uh, but that doesn't tell us that uh, in general evidence conformity, and in particular evidence conformity where you're taking the claims, for instance, of epistemic authorities at face value, uh, doesn't tell us that there's anything wrong with that or that that isn't a reliable indicator of truth. Um, and the last sort of objection would be that the pessimistic meta-induction begs the question by assuming the falsity of various conspiracy theories. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that most of the theories that I've mentioned, for instance, are, are false. Um, so in practice, right, even the most hardened conspiracy theorist, I think, rejects most conspiracy theories. Um, uh, and so I, I don't think that they'll really be uh, too tempted by this response. Um, and that's not only, that's not sort of a purely psychological quirk of them, but I think there's a strong pressure to, uh, uh, to reject most conspiracy theories, even if you're sort of inclined to believe uh, above average amount of them. Um, and that's because conspiracy theories, um, once you sort of go through the process of making them fit the evidence by positing grander and grander conspiracies, things like that, uh, they come to be mutually incompatible. Uh, so, for example, it can't be the case that the world is dominated by communists, by the deep state, by George Soros, by the CIA, by the New World Order, by reptilians and all that. Ultimately, the grand conspiracies um, that I think you need in order to ensure conformity of conspiracy theories with evidence, uh, they're ultimately going to run into conflict with each other. And so even if you accept some grand conspiracy theory, you'll none that have, nonetheless have reason to doubt um, uh, most of the other ones. Um, <clears throat> you, you might wonder, like, why isn't that just the argument, right? But uh, the thought would be that now when you encounter some new conspiracy theory that doesn't yet conflict with all the other stuff, uh, you already have reason in virtue of uh, having this history of uh, false um, uh, conspiracy theories that nonetheless conform to the evidence. You have reason to be dubious of this, uh, of this new one. Um, and so the last thing I'll say sort of um, in, uh, in support of this argument is that I think it makes sense of what sort of ordinary uh, practice is when it comes to conspiracy theories. So when a lot of people hear a conspiracy theory, they just sort of roll their eyes, say, oh, it's conspiracy theory, right? Um, and I think you can make sense of this by thinking that, well, people are familiar on some level anyway, with how many of these theories there are and how they, you know, can tend to seem plausible if you get too far into them, but how they're nonetheless uh, false. So I think that the pessimistic meta induction actually lines up with how people actually think about conspiracy theories uh, in the real world. Um, <clears throat> okay, here's references and that is about, uh, about it for me. All right, thanks a lot, Keith, for a very interesting talk. I'll 